Okay, that seems to have worked. Thank you everyone and welcome to our second virtual talk that we're having for the MIT Club of Australia in 2024. I'm really pleased to invite today my colleague, uh, Hugo, who is a geochronologist who's based at Curtin University in Western Australia. Hugo and I have worked on a couple of projects over the years and I've just stayed really interested in his work. Some work of his, it's not often that you get geology papers in the news, but um, a few months ago, Hugo had quite a bit of press about a really interesting research study that he did about pink diamonds from the Aragal mine here in Australia and why you have those really unusual pink diamonds at the mine. So Hugo's had some stuff in the news and he's also had a lot of other really interesting and valuable research for various industries, including the minerals industry here in Australia that maybe hasn't always made the front page of the New York Times, but is still really interesting. And I think he'll be talking today about a variety of his research in the geochronology field. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Hugo. If you have a really pressing question, raise your hands and we'll take questions. Otherwise, let's um, try and let Hugo get through his talk and then we'll make sure that we've got some time for questions at the end. Cool. Thanks very much for the introduction, Evelyn. I'll, I will disclaimer: I did not get the front page news of the New York Times. I think I was on page six or something like that. Maybe. Oh, all right. Page. Well, it was that's pretty it was good for a geology mind. story, Hugo. Um, so what I'll talk to you a little bit about today is a couple of different terms here in the in this title. We're, we're going to talk about geochronology and what that really is. We're going to talk about a little bit about the minerals industry. So that's mining, exploring for metals, um, things that we need particularly now in this sort of day and age, this sort of climate, um, or this climate of climate change, let's say, about how can we transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy and the things that we need more of to, to get there. So a lot of my work um, still ha still happening now, particularly in the last sort of four or five years, has been trying to enable the minerals industry to understand their prospects, their deposits, their, little, their regions essentially to help them try and find more copper, more lithium, more gold, whatever that might be. Um, the photo I've got here in the background, this I, I live in Perth. Uh, Perth City here is in the background, but this is the Curtin University campus with a envisaged uh, building of what they, uh, the, the name has changed, but um, they're calling this a super science building, which hopefully will realize reality in 2027. Um, and I'm sitting, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sitting in this building currently right here. So just, it'll be a stone's throw away from where we are, six floors of, uh, of all glass, lots of solar panels on there. And I quite like this shot because of the amount of attention they have given to making it a, a environmentally sustainable building. Um, I particularly love, say, all those solar panels that you can't quite see and count how many there are, but there are hundreds on that building to try and offset some of our carbon footprint there. But the first thing, I guess, is what is geochronology? And it really has two terms built into it. It has geo, meaning earth, um, and chronology, meaning just the timing of different things. And really that this field of study intersects a lot of other earth science disciplines. Uh, it can inter intersect things like looking at planetary science, so looking outside of our, um, of our earth system. It may be looking at things like tectonics. So how do plates move? How do they come together? How do they go up and down? It can even intersect things like geomorphology. So how has the shape of the Earth's surface changed uh, over time and what controls that? Um, we could even be looking at human evolution and how this has changed. So looking at, we, uh, you'll often see paleo written in the past. So this is the past of something, anthropology, meaning the human movement. Um, and I quite like this image on the right here, which is an image that, kind of gives you an impression of what Earth timeline is like. So right in this this tiny little bit in the middle, it's 4.5 billion years ago when the Earth was first formed. And as you sort of spiral upwards, you have the first life, um, well, probably a bit before that, first life 3.5 billion years ago, the first sort of slightly more complex life 2 billion years ago. And, and it seems to sort of just spiral upwards and outwards until we get to us here, sort of 1 to 2 to maybe even 3 million years ago. And there's a lot of ha that's happened over that timeline, um, not only in terms of life that you might see, but certainly in terms of the mineral system process. And that's really what I want to focus on today. And 
one of the things that we think about when we talk about mineral systems, and I appreciate this slide for those who haven't um, got an earth science background, might be a little bit heavy. One of the things that we often are concerned with is the, the scale of exploration, the scale of different processes. So those processes can range from something that's globally happening. So for example, taking the Pacific Rim of Fire and you've got volcanoes and earthquakes all around it. And what controls where those earthquakes and, and volcanoes are located? So looking at that much larger process to something that is very much at the, what we call the deposit scale, something that might be a kilometer or, or smaller even. Um, but on the, on the y-axis of this, you have time. And certain things take, particularly on the global scale, take a long time to sort of these processes to move around. But often in the more deposit side, we're, we're concerned with those those small little processes that that makes makes or breaks whether you have a, a copper deposit, let's say, or you don't have one. You might just have a little sprinkling of copper there, but not enough for you to economically be able to extract those minerals. And within that, there's a whole bunch of different um, processes that are going on that you all need these four, well, you need these various components to be in harmony for you to be able to have a deposit. You, you'll need a source. You need something that has metals or fluids in it that well, you, if you don't have any copper, you're not going to get a copper deposit. You need some pathway for the, those fluids to be transported. And they could be transported through uh, a little discontinuity in, in the earth, so a little, a little fault, a little crack in there, and you can shoot fluids and metals through that. You need some sort of trap. So a really common one is, and there's a lot of processes in earth science that are controlled by uh, reduction oxidation. And so often if you have a, a let's say, a reducing fluid, that metal might be soluble in there and you have a um, uh, an oxidizing fluid, that metal might be insoluble, just an example. So when there might be a little spot here where this ore might come into contact with a with a with uh, some sort of trap mechanism and then your copper falls out. And then importantly, one, one of them that is probably the hardest to characterize is preserving that, is making sure that maybe it happened two and a half billion years ago that you actually put the copper in its place, but you now from two and a half billion years ago to today, with the time we're mining it, need to be able to preserve that, that mineralization, that, that copper enrichment. And that's very difficult to characterize. But hopefully what you, I guess, realize across all these different things is there's a very much a three-dimensional aspect to it. But there's very much also a fourth dimensional aspect, and that's the time component. And that's really what I'm interested in and, and is helping to try and get the, that mineral industry to understand those different uh, timing processes, to, to help them to understand not just the absolute timing, but also the, the rates and the the durations of geological processes to try and help them characterize the area that they're working on. So just to give you a few examples of what that could be. Um, and there are a few examples from all over the place. I'll, I'll give you a, a simple one here at the, at the bottom is uh, you might have different um, geological layers. Uh, so you've got this little orange layer in here uh, that's in there. And you can you don't have to be a geochronological expert there to realize that, hey, the orange units seem to connect and they seem to have the same kind of rocks on either side. But just because the rock type is the same, it doesn't mean it's the same age. And if actually, if we were to date this particular rock, you actually realize that the bottom of this orange layer is equivalent to the bottom of this yellow layer. And this is quite a challenging concept. Um, and this is, again, relatively easy when you have a nice stack of it. So think Grand Canyon style, you've got a nice big river flowing to the bottom. You can see the layers on either side. You can correlate those up and you might be able to correlate them even further across areas, um, let's say, outside the Colorado River. But when you take these units and you flip them on its side and you chop them up and you might fold them up and down, it can often be very difficult to find, you know, is this orange layer that I see here, is this the same orange layer across the whole area that I'm in? Or are they different orange layers and they've, they've just been folded back on each other? These are quite challenging little concepts. I guess the other thing that we, we like to do is we try to look at uh, maps of uh, where the where the best metal sources are. Most of our metals come from deep down inside the earth, inside the mantle. So you've got the crust, the mantle, the core. So they come from that mantle domain. Um, and essentially the way this this is a what they call a, a hafnium isotopic plot. So use the, the, the element hafnium. We want to be sitting in this little red zone here for the for the metals to be really um fertile, if you like, in this case. And so you can see this is a map of of uh, southwest of Western Australia. So Perth is about here. 
Um, this is sort of the, the southwest coast. And this is a fairly large area. This is a couple of thousand kilometers, or maybe a thousand kilometers across. And you can see that this sort of southeastern corner is particularly the most fertile region. Um, and that's actually helped a few companies discover nice nickel copper deposits, nice gold deposits uh, in this region. Um, not necessarily based off this work. This was kind of done the opposite way around. Is the question is why did they discover it, and why was there less stuff, say, further towards this side? Um, I'll skip through some of these more, say, slightly more complex examples. So the basic principle. So just a bit of a one-on-one -on, -one on how geochronology works. Um, so I won't talk to you too much about fossils. We can certainly use fossils to help to, to date rocks, um, but they only are really applicable is a if you have a fossiliferous horizon. So if you have, for example, a rock that doesn't contain any fossils, well, it's not particularly going to be particularly useful to be able to help you with it. It also doesn't help once you go past sort of 500 million years back into Earth's history, you don't really have any fossil bearing horizons. So when you go into Earth deep time, if you like, you need something else. And there, that's where absolute chronology comes into it, and that involves dating rocks. And the way you date rocks is you uh, rocks uh, some crystals, some minerals inside rocks uh, contain radioactive elements, things like uranium, things like potassium. Um, and that parent isotope over some time decays and it produces a daughter isotope. And it can either produce a daughter isotope through an alpha decay, through a beta decay, or through a gamma decay. Um, and what dictates whether something decays? Well, if again, this is a, a plot of the number of protons and the number of neutrons on it. And you see, I mean, I quite like my, my periodic table, so there's always one of me on a mug here. Um, if you're in that sort of black line in here, you've got a stable, a stable um, uh, element or stable isotope, if you like, so an element of a particular mass. Um, but anywhere above or below that, so if you have too many neutrons or too little neutrons, then you start to have radioactive decay. And the, depending on where they sit, it depends what kind of decay that you have. The bottom line with this is we do need minerals. We do need crystals inside our rocks that have some of this well, some of these radioactive things in there. Without that, and a certain crystals, for example, if you take something like quartz, it's silicon and oxygen, there's almost nothing that fits in that structure, and we can't actually date quartz. So we have to look for crystals that may not be our most abundant thing in that rock, but something that still gives us the age of whatever we're looking for. Uh, to kind of explain this uh, in a bit more, um, each radiometric decay system is governed by what's called a half-life. So the time it takes for half of that original amount to disappear. So let's say you had 100 grams of um, whatever that might be. In this case, this is, let's say, cobalt, a particular isotope of cobalt. In 5.3 years, you now only have 50 grams left of the original cobalt, and half of it you've turned into nickel uh, of a particular isotope. And again, you leave another 5.3 years, you now have 25% left of the original parent and 75% of the daughter now, and so on and so forth. Um, you can do the same with carbon dating. So carbon-14 goes to nitrogen-14, and that has a half-life much longer, almost 6,000 years. Um, and again, the same thing, it goes into this sort of logarithmic curve um, as it slows down. Hopefully what you can appreciate with this is if you're trying to date something particularly old or particularly young, you have to use a system that is good for you. So for example, is over time, if I, if I have a few more of these half-lives, and sort of the rule of thumb is about eight to 10 half-lives. So once you get to sort of something that's 40 or 50 years old, you have so little of the parent left that if you try to measure that using mass spectrometry techniques, you just can't measure any of that parent left, and you don't actually know how much you started with. You need to know to be able to date your rock. You need to know how much parent you have in your rock and how much daughter you have. If you can't measure either of them, you won't get a, a precise enough answer. Uh, the same thing with carbon dating. Once you start getting to something on, on the order of sort of 30, 40, 50,000 years, carbon dating becomes useless. Before I sort of get to geological dating stuff, I'll, I'll give you a few sort of fun ones that I like. Um, one here is we look at carbon. This is not a maybe a true dating one, but we look at carbon 14. Um, and you can also look at a few other ones. There's a, a funky chloride, uh, a chlorine one, and a funky strontium one. That you actually see this spike in the geological record in about the sort of starting in the mid-1950s. And it's used for dating soils all over the world. 
And what they're actually dating is they're dating nuclear bomb tests. When when the, the Americans and the Russians were testing bombs in their own locations, all that plume, if you like, all that cloud that rained out over all the soils can tell you when you have a soil that was deposited essentially in the 1950s. Uh, perhaps my favorite one is, let's say you've got a really expensive collection of wine and you've got bottles from, in this case, on this particular image, bottles from 1784, right? And you want to know, is that bottle actually from 1784 or was it one that they've made to look old and, you know, they've added some, some well, they could have added water and you're not going to open it to find out probably. They could have added wine from yesterday and there. There's a, a cool technique that you can use with hydrogen to be able to, so this little three hydrogen, to be able to, you dip a needle inside the cork, you extract a bit of fluid, and you can actually date how old that wine is inside that. Again, it's a relatively expensive technique, but if you've got a 250-year-old bottle of wine, you might want to know that it was 250 uh, years old and not completely ripped off. But these things have half-lives of, of something on the order of 30 years. Um, and again, would be very kind of pointless to use in the geological timescale, keeping in mind you have four and a half billion years of Earth's history. You have nothing, after 300 years, you have nothing left of that parent isotope. Again, carbon-14 sort of stops around 40,000 years, and you can use some of these, these things, krypton and some helium, that you're able to look at very old groundwater up to, say, a million years. And we can use some of these, these systems here to look at things like human migration. You know, when did the Grand Canyon form? Um, these things are all happen on the, you know, maybe a few million years to very short things in the present day. But what happens when you do want to look at Earth's deep past? What do you use then? Well, we need to use radioactive systems that actually have half-lives that are appreciably long. And so I've put a few up here, uh, and these are the main ones that are, that are used in, in, say, my line of, uh, line of work. And this half-life here is in billions of years. So you've got here uranium-235. This is the, the least radioactive, if you like, or, the, or if you like, the most radioactive on this one. It's got a half-life of 700 million years, right? So all of a sudden, if you've got a rock now that is 700 million years uh, old, half of it should have decayed and half of it should still be left over. But there's ones that are essentially the age of the Earth, four and a half billion years old. There's ones that are way older than the Earth, 106 billion years ago. The biggest drama with these rocks is actually the opposite, trying to date very young rocks because now you don't have enough daughter isotope. So I guess the key take-home message from this is there are lots of these different systems in place and knowing how roughly how old your rock is or roughly how young your rock is dictates kind of what kind of technique that you want to be able to use for that. Um, I'm very privileged, I think, uh, working at Curtin is that we have an incredible array of tools here to be able to pick and choose exactly what we're going to use for whatever applications. Um, I complain when I have to walk to the building next door. Um, you know, so far it's 100 meters. But it is, in, I've been to many universities, many research centers in the world, and they just have a, a limited finite selection of tools. Um, I had a colleague who worked in Puerto Rico for a long time, and he said once a year he would travel to the US and he would do all his analyses there, all in one go in Wisconsin, and then have to travel back because they just didn't have the equipment. Um, so it's, again, it's a fantastic um, place to work. I've given you a snapshot of some of these instruments. Um, you don't necessarily need to know what they do, but they're all pretty fancy. I mean, look at this one. This one's got like a little green, I don't know if it's neon, but some sort of fancy light. I mean, it's got to be expensive, right? If, if it's got a nice bright, shiny light on it. Um, we have machines that look a bit old and a bit and sort of more uh, older looking labs, and we've got some very expensive things. I think all up now, we, we just crossed the threshold of about $50 million in instruments. Um, I'd say it's, a, again, a wonderful place to get uh, and to walk across. And all these things are just in the two buildings that are next to us. And all these things will be moved into that super science building in a couple of years to come. But you've got all these different dating techniques. And the way we normally write these things down as well is we have the, the parent isotope at the beginning and the daughter isotope at the end. So uranium eventually decays to lead, rubidium goes to strontium, lutetium to hafnium, samarium to neodymium. Um, that's really the, the take home message from that. The question is, and this is a question that you might want to answer. So if I just go back one slide, if I go back one slide. Um, I'll just focus here on these top three ones, because one of the things you might notice in these top three ones, they're all applicable for uranium lead. And this is probably the geochronologist's favorite tool. Um, but the question is, when do you use 
which one, if you like, what choice do you have in terms of dating? And that really comes down to three things. It comes down to precision. In other words, how well can you constrain that number? It comes down to efficiency, if you like, how many samples can you analyze a day? And how complex your, your crystal is that you're trying to analyze. So for example, if I wanted to know to the, maybe to within sub 10,000 years when the dinosaurs went extinct, then I choose TIMS, ID TIMS, this, this little technique here that is able to give us, in this case, the precision here. So the, the way this, this graph works is on the, on the Y axis, you have the age in millions of years. On the, I guess, spread across the X axis, you've actually got analyses that have been done through five different techniques. Uh, the first or these, the, the yellow and the red and blue ones are done by uh, laser ablation. Um, there's a green one done here by something called shrimp. I mean, we geologists, we have fantastic acronyms, all these things. Um, and the, the width, if you like, of this little gray bar that you can see dictates that precision. So the bigger the bar is, the less precise it is. The smaller the bar is, the more precise it is. You can tell they're all giving you essentially the same age. They're all accurate techniques. But this ID Tim's one, you know, and the, the precision here is... Sorry, it's quantified here on the bottom. So you get an age on each of these of about 555 million years. This yellow bar technique gives you a plus minus and, and an age is good, but the uncertainty is just as important than the age. An age without an uncertainty is meaningless. Here you're getting sort of plus minus just about 3 million years. Here you're getting something that's plus minus 0 0.08 million years, so 80,000 years. And again, if you want to know the dinosaurs, I don't want to just know whether they went extinct. Eh, roughly then, I want to know if I can pinpoint the day when a meteorite smashed into Earth and killed the dinos, I want to know that as best as possible. So why don't we use that technique all the time? Well, the trade-off here is that, Tim's you can analyze maybe half to one sample per day. When you, when you jump up to something like laser ablation, you can analyze 10, maybe even 20 times that amount in a single day. The other thing that's a, a problem here is with, with Tim's data, you've actually got to take this, this little grain. This is a little grain of, of something called zircon. And it's got, it's got actually a little pit inside it. You've actually got to take that crystal, dissolve it in acids, and analyze the full amount of it. Some of these other techniques, this laser ablation Sims technique, you're actually able to drill little pits. So you can actually just analyze a single little area. And particularly as we go back in geological time, what we realize is some of these crystals have complex zoning. And a crystal core, if you like, might, might recall one age, but that crystal might have undergone a second event that might form a rim of something that are of a different age. If you were to take that whole crystal and dunk it in there, you get an absolutely meaningless number. Somewhere in between that makes no sense whatsoever. But with some of these, these point-based techniques, we can actually target certain different amounts of different parts of the crystals to get a better age and a better constraint of itself. The other concept that's quite useful is this idea of what we call closure temperature. So um, there's lots of different minerals to date. And each of these minerals has a different um, temperature at which that crystal becomes closed. And I guess the best way I, I can uh, explain this is imagine you've got your fingers, right? And as uh, as they get hotter, each crystal's got atomic bonds uh, between them. As, as that crystal gets hotter, as that rock gets hotter, our fingers get further apart. It's like the crystal lattice gets further apart. And there's a point at which point the crystal lattice is so wide that the daughter, say, take something like lead, for example, a little uranium lead, the daughter can, is, can escape out. And if it's constantly escaping out, so if our crystal of zircon here is above 800, 900 degrees, our lead is constantly escaping out. And essentially, the clock is constantly zero. Because when you measure it, you have 100% uranium, 0% lead, because that lead is constantly escaping. Then as that rock cools, eventually the crystals stop vibrating as much, and they, they close their lattice, if you like, and now that lead is stuck. It cannot get out of that crystal. That's when the time starts ticking. That's when your clock starts recording. And we might want to know when that crystal uh, in, and say, the magma chamber, so you've got a volcano, crystal spews out, crystal crystallized, and it lays there. Something like zircon might be great because zircon is extremely robust. It won't be altered by anything else. That'll tell us the age of the eruption. But maybe we're actually interested in when, say, some groundwater came over the top, altered some of those crystals. Well, we, we might want to use a technique that's more down this end, more on the cooler end, that might actually tell us the same thing. 
What you might even notice on this plot is that the same mineral comes up in multiple places with different uh, radioactive systems. So you can see zircon here with the uranium lead is, is positioned here. You can also see zircon here with something called uranium thorium helium in two different spots. You can even see someone here to call fission track zircon. So different, the same mineral can have different bits of information. Um, you might even be able to do the same with all three crystals and really piece together that geological story. So just because you see one number being spat out of one crystal, you've got to make sure that what you're tying that to, what you know is happening, uh, is the question that you're trying to answer. And I guess the other thing that really helps us, is to, and this is the biggest thing, is every mineral, every crystal, if you like, those are the elements that make up a rock. The image here I'm showing you on the on the left and right in this case are false color images where each different color is a different mineral. And I've got a list of these minerals on there, say from most abundant to least abundant. But we want to try and date something that's meaningful. The, the image on the left here is there is this little thin little vein, and this is say on the order of sort of a, a centimeter as such. And all the little yellow, and there's sort of this, this, yeah, I don't know what you call it, sort of goldy color in here. This goldy colored mineral is what contains all the copper. And what you might realize is that the copper is not sitting in here at all. No, it's just sitting inside these veins. But we can't date the copper mineral. So we have to date something because copper, the, the, this particular mineral, chakopara, doesn't have anything radioactive in it. So we need to date a crystal that is directly related to it, uh, that, that might have something. And in this case, it happened to be a crystal called apatite. It's hard to see these tiny little purple things, but I, I guarantee you they are scattered throughout this little vein system here and not inside the host rock on the side. So context is everything. Knowing what you're dating to try and answer, answer the question that you want to have. For example, in a minerals context, you might have that rock that might have crystallized 3 billion years ago, but the copper might have only come in 2 billion years ago. How do you know what that relative timing is? If I was to date a mineral like zircon, that might tell me that 3 billion year old age. When did that rock, when did that volcano erupt and when did that rock crystallize? But then maybe there's some later fluid that came in that actually dumped my copper inside this rock that cross-cut it all, that might be a billion years later. And if I was to just do my zircon, I'd get the wrong answer. I'd get that three billion year old age. It wouldn't tell me anything about when the copper came. Does that sort of make sense? Hopefully that's um, reasonable. The other thing I sort of alluded to before, um, but didn't fully explain is we can date these things in their context directly. So I can take something like this. This, this is about two and a half mils across. It would have been a little sort of a 50 cent coin. Um, we can take this and put this straight into our machines and with our little laser-based targets, we can actually shoot the crystals that we're interested in exactly where they are. Uh, the big pros of this is it doesn't take any preparation time and you preserve all that textual context. You can also take the rock and you can crush it all up and you can actually extract the crystals that you want. Uh, the big pros with this are is sometimes rocks like this, when you have a nice, just a flat polished surface, you don't actually have enough of the thing that you might be wanting to try and date. You might have two or three crystals of what you want to date, but you want a few more. By actually crushing up a large volume of rock and through ways of look, look, using density or, or magnetic ways of separating and, and concentrating those minerals that we're interested in, we can actually get a whole population of something that we want to uh, date. Um, or in some other techniques that we actually need to physically dissolve the grains, we might want to, we might be interested in just the colorless variants of it. And this is a mineral called plagioclase, which is when it does get slightly altered, it turns into a mineral called sericite. And you can tell them apart very easily under the microscope. One is colorless, one is white. Um, but they are magnetically and density wise essentially the same. So what somebody has to do painstakingly is under the microscope, pick out all these little colorless grains and separate them from all the little white grains. You guys are reminding me of my time at MIT. I spent about six months doing just that, pretty much. <laughs> it's, uh, it's my PhD as well. Now I have students and lab managers to do this for me. So it's lots of fun. But honestly, I still, and after this talk, I'm going to go back to picking a few of these zircon grains because I find it, it's very therapeutic. It's therapeutic, isn't it? When it you're is. having Absolutely. A it's, it's very <laughs> relaxing. You know, your brain's at work. This I put a bit of music on. It's very relaxing to do this sort of thing. Um, and sometimes this sort of breaking it up, particularly when you have to pick these minerals and separate it, is really the only way of doing things. Um, so there's pros, if you like, pros and cons of either technique. And, and we sort of on the fly make decisions of which is the best uh, and what's going to give us the best result for the least amount of time.
And again, we go through a whole different process of how these things, particularly for the the ex situ, so the actual breaking up the part, is where we we sample a rock and uh, and say work with Evelyn, for example. Very often we get samples sent to us, um, you know, rocks in a bag. We 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 chop these up into say smaller size fragments. Uh, we stick them through something called self frag, which is um, it original was designed to help uh, break apart in like something like mobile phones. And actually, if you'll amuse me. Actually, I have it sitting next to me. I have a little. You can probably just hit right here. This is my an old mobile phone of mine that has been completely smushed through the cell frag, and you can see that there's little bits of oops, I'll pull it out, little bits like that of copper that can be pulled out. So they actually use this tool to pull apart the original components of a rock in, in an effort to recycle things. And what it, the way it works actually is it's sticking two or three hundred thousand volts into your sample and actually disaggregating, well, in this case, the rock. In that previous case, the mobile phone. And what it does is actually really neatly separates the crystals because the, it tries to break it apart along the planes of weakness. And in rocks, the plane of weakness is the crystal boundaries. So you sometimes get these beautiful, long needle-like things uh, that break apart. The, the old school way of doing it, and many places still do that because these machines are quite expensive, is you put it in, if you like, a pestle and mortar type uh, thing onto a ring mill and break it up mechanically. And you do get fragments of grains. Then we might go through two different uh, techniques. Uh, if you've ever been gold panning, this is essentially a fancy gold panner, which this entire table is shaking like mad, and your, your heavy crystals stay at the top, and your lighter crystals run to the bottom. Then you can take some heavy liquids. So this is something that is about three times the density of water. And again, you pour your crystals in, and your heavy ones sink to the bottom, your lighter ones sink to the top. And then we have a little magnetic separation. So at the end, if you know, for example, your crystal of zircon is non-magnetic and very heavy, you know what you need to to separate that. Zircon itself tends to be extremely rare. Something like 0.01% of the rock is actually zircon. So if you had to pick through the entire rock, it would take you months. But through these sort of uh, magnetic and gravity, so sort of density separation techniques, you can get a little vial that is 50% zircon. So that upgrading stage is very quick to do without having somebody painstakingly sit at the microscope for too long. And again, then we can choose our our weapon of choice to be able to analyze uh, these different crystals. Again, one of, the, one of the things that we often do in lots of my work has been in helping that mineral in the industry contextualize the rocks, analyzing them, and then reporting them. And this, let's say, because of the sheer amount of equipment we have, I think there's certainly, uh, it's a wonderful place to work at Curtin, and it's very easy to, to do everything in-house. How am I doing for time, by the way? Let's see, 12 of five. I've got a little bit of time. All right. got about 20, 20 minutes, Hugo. Okay, 25 20. minutes. So yeah, I'll, that'll bring us to the hour, and then I'm happy to stay on a bit longer if anyone wants to ask questions. I'll, I'll just go into a few little case studies. Um, pink diamonds are coming. So if you're interested in that, uh, stay tuned. Uh, this is one that Evelyn, uh, oh no, Evelyn was, sorry, Evelyn, you're my second case study at the moment. Uh, this is one that uh, probably one of my first projects. This was done in 2019, 2020. Uh, which is quite a useful one. And again, it's all these different projects are collaborations between us at Curtin and some one or more mineral companies uh, in there. And we are here sitting here in southwestern Australia. Um, if you have been here, Esperance is a fantastic place to go. Wonderful beaches. You can The kangaroos are so friendly, you can almost put your arm around them and take uh, snaps with them. Um, but further up in the coast, there's this a deposit called Tropicana. And what Anglo-American were really interested in is Tropicana itself was a big gold de deposit that was discovered in 2005. But they have all these little satellite, little prospects, I'll say. So it's something that just didn't have quite as much gold as they, they thought they were expecting. And the question was, why? Why didn't it have as much gold as Tropicana itself? So we got to work. Um, and what we knew about Tropicana is we knew a few different events that had occurred in, in this region. We knew that there, there was some granite in the area, and that, that granite was about 2.7 billion years old. And we knew pretty shortly after that these rocks got really hot, they got buried really deep inside the Earth's crust. They didn't really melt, but they got buried really deeply. And they got stuck there for about 150 million years. They got stuck really deep. And what that does, that all that temperature and pressure starts to metamorphose those minerals, turns them into other minerals. And then shortly after that, you actually brought the rock partly back up to the surface, and that back up to the surface is what they thought the gold Came in and people had done some work on there and got this age of about two two point five three billion years ago. Um, sorry, but I should clarify. When you see this MA, it's millions of atoms. You might see GA written there. That's giga or uh, billions of atoms. So there's millions and billions. 
Um, the question was, there was some events that people know of, you know, almost, well, more than a billion years after this, but there hadn't really been, really been a record in Tropicana. So maybe there was something else going on, part of the story. And so what we did is we actually, again, took that contextualizing approach. And we realized quite quickly that there was these two, uh, a mineral called biotite. It's this little sheet-like uh, mineral. It was actually one of the first crystals that we used as confetti or, or glitter. And it's still used today in in women's makeup, well, women's, men's too, I suppose, uh, makeup products. But it's, it gives a, a sheen or a sparkle, if you like, as you're putting foundation on. But we realized that there's these, these beautifully formed crystals, these pinky bits. And then there's these sort of yeah crummy looking ones that are interweaved with this gray looking mineral in there. Uh, in a different kind of view in there, you can see this sort of dark mineral in here. That's the same as this pink mineral in there. And then there's some sort of lighter greenish brown mineral in there. And we realized there were two of these generations of this mineral called biotite. And what we also realized is that one generation was, was associated with one gold bearing event. And the other generation was associated with another gold bearing event. So we thought, hey, if we could date these two different minerals, and if they give us different ages, maybe that tells us something about these two gold bearing events. And we did exactly that. So these are images here of images taken under a scanning electron microscope, and they're at really high resolution. So this is 50 microns, so half the width of a human hair, let's say. Um, and then these, these are the remnant holes where we date them. So here we took this, uh, these sort of biotite two, this sort of dirty looking one. And here in the top corner, this, this bit in here is for that biotite one, that very beautiful looking single crystal thing. And what we actually realized is that there was two very separate ages. The, the older one was about 2530. What previous workers had shown was that they thought was the sole gold mineralizing event. But this second biotite two had a much younger age that had an age of about 1200 million years ago. And that was quite well, quite novel, quite um, surprising in, in a way. And one of the things that we then took a little bit further is we actually said, well, we've got two ages at Tropicana. What about these other little satellite prospects around it? And quite quickly, we realized as we're looking at these crystals, it didn't really have that second generation um, or it didn't have two generations, just seemed to have this one generation of, of in this case, Muscovite, a very similar crystal to Biotite. And we dated that. And while it was, in this case, very imprecise, it was still essentially this 1.2 billion year event. And so what we concluded is, hey, these satellite prospects, these little bits around the outside, they only had that one gold mineralizing event. For you to be able to get that economic size deposit, you seem to need two. And you certainly seem to need that very first event. This, this second event that happened 1.2 billion years ago was just not as gold rich. Maybe it remobilized some stuff, but it really didn't bring much extra gold into it. Maybe it added 10% extra gold, and that was okay for Tropicana, but for something around the outside that just didn't give you enough information. So when you, again, when you put all this together with all the other previous uh, analyses, you just seem to have these two separate events. You seem to have something at 2.5 billion years old and something at 1.2 billion years old. And really what it boiled down to is, again, we went back to Anglo Gold with this, and we said, hey, look, um, we really don't think all these other little gold triangles around the outside will ever be perspective. And we dated, say, after this, we dated a few more of these and again, found much the same thing, but only had this 1.2 billion year event. And as a result of this, um, and I said, I don't like to bring negative conclusions to industry, but I'd rather bring conclu negative conclusions and no conclusions at all, is they actually sold off quite a bit of the tenement around the outside. They actually, ironically, two years ago, ended up rebuying a lot of it, but not looking for gold, but looking for something else. Uh, now, but it's it's certainly it's it's a way for uh, what we do in this case would have cost a couple of tens of thousands of dollars, but it saves them big bucks in the long run. Uh, the second project, and you notice Evelyn is very youthful looking, right? This was quite a few years ago, now, I think. Um, in this picture, again, a nice little um, collaboration between us here at Curtin, Anglo American, and a few uh, other players in the game here. Uh, Rowena is particularly excellent at doing a lot of our contextualization. Uh, she was looking on, she's a fantastic, uh, what we call petrographer. She's really good at looking under the microscope in being able to characterize all these different rocks and minerals. We're in Queensland now. So we've jumped across the place here with this little uh, black square here. And we're in something called the Mount Isa uh, terrain. So if you've ever been to Mount Isa, it is, well, it's pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Um, but this is not where 
Evelyn and her team worked. They worked even more in the middle of nowhere. They worked in a place called Bula, which I've never been to Evelyn. And I'm we sure. weren't even in Bula. We were in an exploration camp that was close to Bula, but we just had a exploration container camp in the middle of absolutely nowhere. So it really was nothing around other than our, our drill rigs. No, that's it's uh, geology can can often be very remote. Um, so you get to know your uh, your teammates quite well. Um, I've just spent a week in on the south coast with a hundred students, and you start to know each other's habits pretty well after that. Um, in this case, there was no rock at the surface; it was just let's say sand and soil. And what they need to do is they need to drill holes, and you drill pores, so you drill actually pipes, and the rock comes through that. Yeah, I mean we had rocks, but they weren't the rocks that had the minerals in them. So there were these. There was almost a kilometer of younger rocks that we didn't think would have the minerals in them when we were trying to find out what was underneath because Mount Isa, as you might know, is one of the biggest deposits ever in the world. It's just coming to the end of its life after being mined for a very, very long time. So we were trying to find another one of these under some some other younger rocks. Um, that was that was the idea. Mm. And you can see some of this, this these sort of red lines and this is a, a, well, these are various, um, maps a look at the magnetics and the density of the Earth's crust. And you can see that there's some sort of trends that go down. And I guess Evelyn's idea was, well, if you can find, if Mount Isa has lots, if I was to continue this trend along, hmm, maybe the stuff under the surface should also have it. Um, and after you go through about 800 meters to a kilometer worth of other stuff, I mean, you find some fun stuff. This is a little fossil of, uh, this is Evelyn's photo herself, of a uh, of something called trilobite. So it creatures of an extinct about 250 million years ago. Um, and some of the first complex life that existed on Earth. Once you went all through that, you went into the rocks that they were particularly interested in. And when I sort of came on this project, I sort of came on a midway. Um, uh, but throughout the, the end, they had seven drill holes, uh, these these MSD series of drill holes uh, in there. And again, we dated rocks from all over the place. And these, these rocks were all on sort of on the uh, roughly 1.8 billion years ago, give or take uh, a couple of millions of years either side. Um, but they were fairly old in the end, older than I think what they were expecting. Uh, older certainly in terms of what they knew would have been perspective in the area. And what quite quickly they realized, in fact, I might just actually skip across this. Um, what they realized is all, and I'll show you this on this, these little, um, these little um, diamonds here are some of these mineral deposits that are known from the Mount Isa uh, the outcropping rocks, if you like, of Mount Isa itself. So you got a few of these red ones in here. You got some blue ones in there, some green ones in there. But in this sort of area in here, there was very little. You, you had a few little triangles floating about here. But really, Evelyn and her team were, were hoping to encounter rocks that were quite a bit younger because these were more prospective for what they were looking for. Mount Isa itself is much, much younger, 1,660 million years old. So they were hoping to get rocks of, of that age. But I think quite quickly what we showed is that this sort of um, region that they were in after about seven drill holes really was unsuitable for what they were trying to look for. And again, yeah, and I, it was it was really useful because from if you if you think back to Hugo's one of his first slides where he was talking about lithology or what the rock is versus age. If you look at the rocks, they look exactly the same as the rocks you'd have at Mount Isa. You can't tell them apart. They're the same thing in terms of the rock classification. And the only way that we could figure out if they were the rocks we thought they were, because remember, you don't have the context of mapping, you just have these little pinhole drill holes, was to try and see, okay, well, are we in the right age ballpark? Do we keep drilling or not? And um, it was great for us because we dropped all this tenure and we were able to get in and out in two years really quick and not spend more money and rather take our exploration money and spend it somewhere else. That's right. So I think so that's a negative right. result, but um, spending the money on this helped us not spend more money. I think more often than not, I provide negative results. Um, and I think that's just the part and parcel of exploration is you get more negative when you explore. There's, there's more negative results than there are positive results. But what I at least always hope to do, and it doesn't always happen, is at least have conclusive results. Um, so it makes helps Evelyn make decisions like that to say, well, let's abandon this little area and let's go somewhere else. And somewhere else might be the next big mine eyes I like deposit. Um, certainly, I think Anglo are having a bit more fun a few hundred kilometers further east than where they are now. Um, all right, the very last little case study I'll show you is is what we did last year with uh, Rio Tinto with Argyle. And, and this is, say, a little story of pink diamonds and why Argyle is so particularly unusual. Um, what I might 
I'm assuming most of you, maybe you have seen a pink diamond. Um, I was not privileged to it until uh, only a few years ago. But um, what pink, what makes pink diamonds unusual is that they're actually not, well, they're not fully pink. They are actually only pink along certain little planes. These, you can have these little sort of little gratings in them. Um, but what that means is if you take a diamond and you look at it from a different angle, it might look colorless to you. So a gemologist, somebody who cuts these diamonds and, and puts them into, say, rings, needs to be very aware where that pinkness is. And I guess what I always assumed, um, and again, this is my only diamond project I've ever worked with, but what I always assumed is that all the colors in diamonds were due to impurities. Maybe there's a little bit of boron or a little bit of nitrogen in there that makes it blue or yellow. Pinks, on the other hand, have no impurities in them. They're just still, they're pure carbon. The only difference is this: these diamonds have been deformed. So you wouldn't like, maybe not believe it, but diamond being the hardest, uh, just about the hardest man-made substance on earth, but diamonds can bend and twist as well. And it's that bending and twisting thing that turns them pink. In fact, if you twist it just a little bit, they go pink, a little bit more dark pink, a little bit more, they might even go red for a bit. And you push too hard and they start to go into these sort of brownie colors. I guess what we wanted to try and find out, and, and Rio Tinto also sort of came to us sort of with the same sort of question, is why Argyle? And where do you, well, let's put this, where do you find these pink diamonds in the world? They are not neatly distributed all in, in different mines in the world. No, Argyle made up about, well, nine tenths plus of the global pink diamond supply. And they, they closed in, in 2020. It says due to an exhausted supply, but it actually is due to poor geology. Um, they ended up drilling their mining shafts exactly where the high grade uh, deposit was. And it's because of poor geology done in the 1980s that they had to close it uh, up. Um, Argyle itself actually was not very, not very diamond rich, or they didn't have very many big diamonds. So their sort of pink diamonds that were getting out sort of regularly was what actually just about kept them in, in business. But pink diamonds still, even here, even that, even though they were the massive global player in pink diamonds, Argyle only made up less than 1% of, uh, sorry, pink diamonds only made up less than 1% of all the diamonds that were recovered. 80% of them were brown. And hopefully you're starting to get, there's a bit of a connection there between pinks and brown diamonds. In this case, it seems to be that whatever was pushing these diamonds, in most cases, pushed too hard and turned those, what might've been originally colorless to pink to brown. And well, in the 1980s, they tried to sell these brown diamonds too. And the first um, advertising and the first media marketing campaign that came up with it tried to sell the brown diamonds as brown sugar, which didn't go very well. Um, I think they had a chocolate diamond advertising uh, campaign at some yeah, point. Yeah, there we go. They're, so really the not that, they're not that pretty, really. Yeah. <laughs> the sec second marketing, first marketing team got all fired. Second marketing team came in and they started calling them champagne, cognac, and chocolate diamonds for light oh, that's and right. dark brown. Yeah, I didn't really. Yeah, they did a bit but at the end of the day, <laughs> people like Evelyn aren't fooled and they look at a dark brown diamond and go, hmm, that doesn't look that pretty. Um, so pinks is where I was at. And I guess their biggest, Rio Tinto's biggest question is they had to close the mine in 2020. Now what? Um, whilst they were still very happy to have, um, essentially have a little squirreling away of pink diamonds sitting in vaults, um, in the long term, they wanted to try and find a new source of pink diamonds. Uh, and it want, they wanted, obviously, to be them, not to be some competitor. So could we find a new supply? Well, we thought the best place to look is, is Argyle itself. And it's history to try and figure out what was going on with Argyle. Again, very little. And this this often happens with, with older projects, particularly from the, anywhere around the 1900s. Once you find something, you go, great, let's start mining it. And you don't really think about how it formed to be able to help you explore further. Until it comes to the crunch time and goes, oh, we're actually running out now. Oh, maybe we should have thought about how it formed. So that helps us explore more. So Argyle City here in the north of Western Australia. Um, it's got a beautiful little lake here to the top. Um, and this is a, a view from the top of the Argyle mine. And there's a big open pit that runs off to the southern side of this. So that, that image I showed you before is kind of uh, uh, the lake, if you like, just sits just above here. And this is kind of looking at the top uh, of that mine. The the sort of ready orangey unit here are these are, are parts of the deposit. Uh, the yellow and the gray stuff around it is say, outside the deposit. Um, and we got some samples here from what is affectionately known as the honeypot. 
um, Winnie Pooh and the Honey Pot, you know, the, in this case, it was the high grade thing where it was the most rich in diamonds. Now, what you've got to understand about diamonds and, and the kind of rock types they sit in is they're a bit weird. They're not like, they're sort of like volcanoes and sort of not like volcanoes. Is the kind of upside down volcanoes. You you expect your your normal volcano to be a nice cone shaped thing. Diamonds are upside down cones. They're like carrots, if you like, and they actually um, form really really deep down. They are very rich in either CO two or water. And what happens, much like if you have a hot air balloon, and you uh, you eventually make it rise. Actually, what what happens is you rise even further because of the the pressure that diminishes on it. Um, but the way these, these what we call diatremes in place is kind of more like a champagne bottle. So imagine you take a champagne bottle of the core and you shake it up. You know, when you open that champagne bottle, it always takes a little bit of effort at the very start to get that champagne bottle moving. But once you've got it going, it's just going to go and explode up. So this first stage really deep down, this could be 30, 40 kilometers down, even 150 kilometers down. You're starting to just, just agitate that. And as it gets agitated, it can blow through the earth in, in a matter of, of well, days to, to seconds, essentially, the last little bit explodes. And it's no no um, no uh, eruption of these diatribes has ever occurred in at least in the last probably 2,000 years. Uh, oh, longer than that, yeah, long no, time. Probably longer than that. There's at least one that's a million years old in, in Antarctica. Uh, that's about the youngest one we know. So not in really well, human history. But you can imagine that would be extremely explosive. And if it happened, say, in a city center, extremely destructive. They're not very wide, though. I mean, this is 250 meters, so they're 200 meters wide. But again, you stick this in the middle of Perth, we'd have some, we'd have some issues. Um, again, highly explosive. And not all of these have diamonds in them. You have to have carbon deep down for you to have diamonds at the top. So what actually happens is, as this thing is exploding up, it explodes really rapidly. And what we think Argyle exploded into is kind of like a, a beachy kind of environment. So you imagine you're sitting at the beaches in Sydney or Brizzy and Perth, and all of a sudden one of the things just blows up into your face. You've got hot rock that's coming up that's mixing with cold seawater and sand. And so the product of rock you get is you actually get these sort of black, dark gray fragments in here. That's the actual volcanic diatreme rock. It's something we call laparite. Um, but in between all that, you actually have little bits of sand in there from the beach, but it's also very water rich because it's absorbed a lot of this seawater that's been uh, floating about. And we can take our fancy little tools and we can take, if I just go back a slide, we can take, oops, if I go back a slide, we can take a little snapshot, say, of something like this, maybe not this exact area, and we can run it through our uh, machine that is able to classify our different uh, minerals or different uh, crystals that are inside there. And you can see there's a few different things. So there's some green colored ones, something called chloride, and there's some um, pinky stuff with, with called quartz. Um, and again, we tried really hard to date these different rocks to try and figure out none of the no normal um, crystals that we could date were really there. There was a little bit of zircon and a little bit of this appetite, both minerals that we date, but we could date. And we tried to date those first to our detriment, let's say. Because when we looked a bit more closely, we actually, if I go back one more slide, we actually realized the zirc on the appetite were not sitting inside these big class, but they were actually sitting in between. Essentially, there were crystals that were there at the beach. That if you were to pick up, again, a handful of beach sand from your local beach, I guarantee you would find some zircon on appetite in there. That's what we were dating. We didn't really realize that to start with. And so we, when we tried to date the rock, we actually realized we've got an enormous spread of different ages, particularly in the zircon. And that's very common in the beach. Again, if you were to pick up a handful of beach sand and date the zircon in your beach sand near your, near your uh, wherever you are, you'd quite quickly realize there's a whole range of different ages because the beach itself, the grains in there have tumbled from all different places. And so there are a whole agglomerate, if you like, of different crystals in there. But we knew at least that the youngest crystals in there, ones that were here were about 1310 million years old the beach if you like could be no younger than this sorry no older than this i apologize to, for you to be able to get a 1.3 billion year old grain is your beach had to be at least be one point uh or could be no older than 1.3 billion years it had to at least be younger than that but it's not always helpful for example if you live in perth and if you picked up a handful of perth beach sand even though it was deposited yesterday the oldest sorry 
keep saying old and youngest, the youngest zircon crystal you'd find in there is about 500 million years old. And that's simply be because in Perth, we've been so stable and so uh, volcanically relaxed, let's say, in the last 500 million years, that there has been no zircon producing rocks for you to shed into the beach. So 1300 is a nice maximum age. It can be no older, but it could still have been a lot younger. And the appetite didn't really work at all. So we thought, well, let's go to one of these really, so we're still going to use zircon appetite, but let's go to the other end membrane. If you remember back from many slides ago, I talked about this concept of closure temperature. Is well, what about the, the idea is well, what if these 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 beach sands got really hot and actually went above this closure temperature and then they cooled straight afterwards? What if that gives us the right age? Well, that also really didn't help very much. Um, it turns out that about 120 million years ago, the rocks got hotter just because Australia was being buried a little bit and then it all came back up. Uh, so appetite didn't really give us an age and zircon was kind of all over the place. And what we kind of realized is some of these younger ages here on the on the bottom left were probably closer towards this 120 million year number and the ones towards the top were probably close to what the true age of Argyle was, but again, not particularly definitive. So we went back, what we should have done before that is got, went back to the rocks. And it was only then when I really looked at it and I saw this mineral called titanite and it's a mineral that we date infrequently it can be done but it's it's a it's a rare one to date and i thought well, where is this actually located inside the rock you can't even really see it if you're looking at this image this, this brown color what i then did is i took that image and i actually just showed just asked it to show me where all the titanium was and that's essentially where that titanite is sitting and i quite quickly realized that it forms these little anastomosing networks that are sitting around these clasts and when i zoomed into that a little bit more you actually realize and this is say this particular area like this is one of these clasts. I realized it surrounded not only the this, this bit in here, which was the lamproite, but also bits of these very round bits of quartz. And that was some of that beach sand. So what seemed to have happened is the titanite seemed to have formed all around these little clasts. And really the main mechanism that would have happened is there is another crystal inside these clasts called perovskite, uh, which lacks some silicon. Quartz, which has silicon in it, what I expected was happening is this volcano came up, this, this upside down carrot, had this mineral called perovskite, had some beach sand, and it fused and, and reacted a lot to form this titanite straight around the outside. So we thought if we could date this titanite, that at least would tell us maybe not exactly when the eruption age was, but probably something fairly soon thereafter. So we thought, let's give that a go. And sure enough, we did. And this time we got an age of about 1260 million years ago. So we assume that, at least very conservatively, it could be no younger than that. But most likely that is probably giving us the true eruption age of Argyle. It might have been a bit older than this still though. So you say to me, so what here? Why, why the heck would we care about the age? What does it actually mean? Well, one of the things that was really unusual about this age, and again, that people had done work on Argyle before, and sort of concluded that Argyle is about 100 million years uh, younger than what we, we found out. And that was unusual because what we know with diamonds is they need some sort of trigger. You need something to get that champagne fork moving, if you like. With, a, with an age of pretty close to this sort of age, somewhere between 1310 and 1260, what actually was happening is uh, about 1300 million years ago, just about all of Earth's continents were sandwiched together in a supercontinent. Uh, you might have heard of one called Pangaea or Gondwana. That's probably our most recent one that we've had. But this was one called Nuna. And Nuna, again, was 1,300 million years old together. But right at this particular point, 1,300 million years ago, it started to break up into different fragments. And Argyle sitting here right at the northern, this Australia's kind of flipped on its side. So this is sort of Western Australia here, South Australia here. If you're living on the eastern seaboard, I'm sorry you weren't here yet. Your rocks that you're sitting on are much younger, so you didn't exist. Um, but North Australia is, say, pointing towards the, the bottom right in this case. It's all flipped on its side. Is this all broke up? And so we, when we sort of looked at this, we realized really there were three ingredients to form pink diamonds. You needed to have carbon that was very deep down. Well, we knew that. We needed to have diamonds. We needed to have some sort of deformation, something bashing together. And again, we sort of knew that already. That happened probably 1.8 billion years ago when the continents in themselves first came together and smashed together. It would have taken originally colorless diamonds and bent and smushed them and turned them pinks and reds and browns. 
But we needed that third ingredient, the ability to take these diamonds from deep down and push them up to the surface. And for that to happen, we needed continents to break up. I think one of the most exciting things with this stuff is I got a phone call uh, a week afterwards from a, a private diamond uh, exploration company and said, hey, look, Hugo, we we also have pink diamonds. We're not part of the one on the ASX or anything like that, so you wouldn't know about our, our findings. But we also have three other localities in Australia, and they're sitting right on the edge of ancient continental blocks, uh, exactly where your model proposed they would be. So if I say, if, if you're looking for pink diamonds, you don't want to go to the heart of continents the heart of big continents, you want to go to the edges. And the edges of continents may now be in the middle of Australia, but they're in the little slivers that would have connected these old continental nuclei all together. Again, we've done a lot of other work, and I say I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll skip over this, but we we work, do all, all kinds of work for companies that are big and small and everything in between. I'll just say thanks for listening. I'll just give you a few last little bits of conclusion. If you fall asleep during any of these points, is really geochronology is, it adds that fourth dimension. It really underpins all different geoscience uh, that we can do. It in itself is pointless, but you take that fourth dimension, you add it to new data sets, makes a phenomenal tool to be able to unravel the, the rates, the time, the durations of different processes. And, and particularly nowadays, so in the last 20 years, we've just come such a long way with analytical techniques that we're able to use all kinds of different ways to be able to dig down into into that answer. And again, we at Curtin have a package that's able to do that to be able to place all that three-dimensional data into a four-dimensional context. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some of these case studies that have helped uh, different exploration companies help uh, reduce their exploration risk. And ultimately that's what it's all about. Um, that's what my, my goal is, at least for them, is to help. Uh, I mean, for me, I'm quite passionate about trying to help mineral explorers find new metals that are able to help us in our energy transition. Hope you've enjoyed listening. And Evelyn, again, thanks for inviting me today. Thanks very much, Hugo. That was a fantastic talk. We'll take some questions. But before that, I just want to say, I know some of you might need to leave uh, now because you might have other obligations. We'll continue to have talks about every second month this year. And we'd like to have them on a variety of topics. Last month, we had one on architecture. We've got one coming up on physics. If you are interested in giving a talk, if you've got a field of specialty, or if you have a colleague, at your place of work or your university who'd be interested in giving a talk, just drop me an email because it would be great to have a fantastic roster of talks. And if we can get some more talks by MIT alums, that would be really good. So that's all for me, but I'm sure that there'll be some questions for you, Hugo. So if anybody has a question, maybe you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody, Hugo, either just uh, speak up or raise your hand. There we go. Here we go. Ooh, David. Oh, Peter's got a question. Do you want me to read it or do you want to say it? Uh, I, I, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, David. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, that was very clear and I loved your graphics. Uh, um, I wondered if you could say anything about the application of this to uh, what we have of uh, moon rocks. We actually do. We have a, in the building right next door to me, we have a quite a big uh, planetary science division. Um, they work on lunar rocks quite a bit. In fact, I shared an office with somebody for a long time who was working on lunar rocks. Um, same techniques, except, exactly the same techniques that get used. Um, in fact, if people have, because of a lot of the uh, moon landing, particularly that Apollo did, a lot of these techniques were developed um, a lot of these little laser-based techniques and these little things were developed on the basis of, hey, we don't want to take a whole chunk of lunar rock, destroy completely. What can we do to still get the same information out and not destroy it? So I'm quite indebted to some of those Apollo missions because it pushed science forward, it pushed those analytical techniques forward. Right. You know, maybe a related question for me. Do any of the, the rovers have abilities to do geochronology in situ? I don't think so. There's one that's, um, I think the most recent one that's, I don't know if it's flying out yet or, I, I'm not, I don't know that much about planetary science, so I could be wrong, but I think the most recent one is trying to do chemical assays. So yeah. that you can actually you mix. Can right. I, I have, I'm not up to speed with the latest one, but it's an interesting idea because one of the challenges of geochronology, it really does limit 
what information you can get because you're basically stuck on the 3D without the 4D. But for planetary geology, unless you can return sample to Earth, there's no way to get that temporal component other than that relative dating. No. So what they do often on the moon, uh, and less so on Mars, is they actually use a technique called crater counting to date mm -hmm. rocks, which is a kind of a, a relative technique. The idea is that if you have a crater and that crater has smaller craters in, on top of it, the more of these smaller craters it has, the older it should be. Whereas if you have a crater that has no other craters on, then it should be very young. But it's not exactly an exact science, right? It, uh, it's still better to have real rocks. Uh, so they uh, they yeah. also use the ejector rays as part of that, don't they? Correct. Yeah, so the idea is that, again, not, not just the crater itself, but if the ejector blanket around the outside also has little craters in it, then, again, you should have more of it. Uh, should be an older rock. Um, but they've shown from from the sample return missions that these numbers, uh, while relatively okay, they're not exact ages, and you could be several hundreds of millions of years off. Um, what the true answer is. Great. Do we have some other questions? I've got Pete, Peter here in the chat. Is this? He's got somebody in the chat. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say your question, Peter, or if you just want us to read it. Oh. You can read it. I can read it. I'll, you can read it, Evelyn. I can answer. <laughs> okay, so Peter had a question. He wanted to know who's funding this work. Is it just the big mining companies or some of the juniors spending on it? Well, I'll let you answer, Hugo, but I will say that one reason I... Um, I don't work in exploration anymore. I work in a different, different department now, but one of the reasons I have always worked for bigger mining companies in my career is they tend to have more money to spend on this kind of thing because proportionally of our exploration budget, it's not as much. But I do think increasingly some of the juniors probably are seeing the value of this work. Would you agree with that, Yuko? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have had quite a lot of juniors. We've had, um, I've had a few companies that, private companies, not so much. I've had one or two private companies approach me. And in the end, when I tell them how much it costs, and it might be a couple of tens of thousands, they say, oof, you know what, I, I don't think I can afford this. But we've certainly had, uh, I've had two companies that have been like ASX listed in the last few months, if you like, that have come to me and they've only been listed for a few months and they're really interested in doing this. So I'm working with a project in uh, with WA1 resources in the centre of Australia, looking for new uh, niobium and rare earth deposits in the centre of Australia. And I worked with another company a few years ago called Moho Resources. Again, they were looking at all kinds of different metals um, east of Mount Isa in this case. Um, very new companies, again, a few months on the ASX kind of thing. So, and you get everything in between, sort of, yeah, from the the the, the giants like Rio Tinto, BHP, Anglo. Uh, both Anglos in this case. Um, I'd say the, probably the largest is probably the mid-tier ones, the ones that are the most agile perhaps still. Uh, maybe some of the very large companies have lost some of that agility to be able to jump into different projects. Um, might not be true, but some say some anecdotal observations um, that I've seen. Anglo-American Anglo is probably an exception to that, but say particularly BHP and Rio Tinto are probably less involved because again, it's, so they've got everything, and their 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 exploration they're doing is really just what they call brownfields exploration, just around the it outside. Depends, I was going to say it depends on the type of exploration. So, geochronology is always interesting and helpful, but you don't always need it to find your mineral deposit. So, if you don't need it, you know you wouldn't pay for it. Although you might regret it later, like in the case of Argyle, they found it, and then <laughs> right as the mine's closing, they're realizing it's useful. I think often it gets dismissed. Yeah. Um, but Anglo, we've got a few geochronology champions so for the past decade or so we've been doing a fair amount but not all the companies have those same champions in them so any other questions for for hugo yeah i, I have really an elementary question I, I kept struggling so when you do this radio um radiometric dating mm -hmm. um don't you need to know like how much was at the beginning do you basically assume that the ratio is zero at the beginning or what, uh, what's correct. I mean, it doesn't. So for we, we always use ratios rather than absolute amounts. Yeah. You don't need to know how much there was at the beginning. The only thing you need to make sure is that your rock has remained closed. If you like that, no, since the time when the clock started ticking, that none of the radioactive daughter product or parent has escaped or entered in. And as long as that's true, and again, we've got ways of looking at those at that data to be able to check that that hasn't happened, then it works. 
So yeah, the, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question because the yeah. early geochronology they definitely focused on minerals where it was zero. So you take something, for example, where the daughter is helium, and if the mineral is, um, you know, if you think about that closure temperature, you could assume that when the mineral formed, it would be zero because all the helium would leave, and then once it cooled past the cooler temperature, uh, the closer temperature, you're starting with zero. But in practice, I think with a lot of the mineral systems these days, like uranium lead, it's not zero. So you do have to have a way of calculating what it was in your equations, right? Um, it's a little bit different with uranium lead, Hugo, I think, because you've got a couple of uh, systems. Yeah. <clears throat> so you have to know how much, in that case, lead, the water product, there was whatever, 100 million years ago or something. Is that, is that so? Well, that's it. So what, because once this, the idea is once, mm -hmm. let's say you take a rock that's 100 million years old. Right, or at least you think it's 100 million years old. You measured the so at 100 million years ago, it was a lava a big eruption. There's you've now got 100%, 100 million years ago, you've got 100% uranium, you have no lead yet. Over time, some of that uranium is slowly converting to lead and it's staying locked inside the crystal. So, over 100 million years, you've only actually scratched the surface, the half life of that uranium. Could have been is it, you know a couple of billion years four and a half billion years but you've produced just enough daughter to be able to measure the ratio of that dot that daughter to parent and that is able to tell you what that age is it was asking that like, what if you had what if you had lead in the crystal to begin with that was yeah that's what there. I mean. yeah so, yeah so that's <laughs> a very, very good question um so lead actually has four different isotopes 204 206 207 208 all four, you can have as what we call common lead. So let's say you have a crystal that forms. Uh, and as it forms, it takes some uranium into its structure and some lead into its structure. So some of that lead is not from the product of radioactive decay. Um, so a mineral like zircon, for example, has almost no lead in it. Its crystal structure just about rejects this common lead, this, this non-radioactive lead. Other crystals like apatite do have some of that. So we have, we have to, have to account and correct for that. One of the nice things with lead is one of those 204 lead is only ever common. So you cannot form it by the product of radioactive decay. 206, 207, and 208 lead are formed by the breakdown of, or the radioactive decay of uranium, these two, and thorium for 208 lead. And they have not quite fixed, but nearly fixed ratios of 204 to 206, 204 to 207, and 204 to 208 lead. And knowing those ratios allows you to be able to subtract that amount from that age. The other clever thing is normally when you date a rock with uranium lead, you can date both the 238 to 206 lead system and the 235 to 207 lead system. So in the same analysis, you get two for the price of one. They're very different uh, radioactive, um, very different half-lives. If they give you the same age, you're doing good because you know that that system has stayed, stayed close, you know you've corrected that common lead correctly. If they give you different ages, which occasionally happens, then you know there's a, a problem, essentially. There's either uh, an, an analytical problem, there's a geological problem. There could be a geological reason, and, and things could lay on lines. But um, thanks, Peter. And uh, But there is, yeah, we, we know how to uh, sort of look at these graphs. So this is, this was one on one, um, Damien. I've got, I think I've got your email. I've got a little presentation I put together on all the isotope systems. If you're interested, I'll, I'll send it to you. But once you get into the field of geochronology, each system is different and you have to think about those corrections differently. And some minerals and isotope systems are easier than others. One of the reasons why a lot of the high resolution geochronology these days is with the uranium thorium lead system is because you can do those corrections with the other systems you have to just really hope that your data is leading you to the right corrections but you're not always certain you don't you don't have that cross check um that concordia we call it with those systems which is really helpful and so, some systems have fallen out of favor exactly because of that because the inability yeah. to be certain and I mean, you can try and duplicate your analyses, triplicate, quadruplicate your analyses. And if you get the same answer every time, well, you're probably in the right ballpark. Yeah. So just be and, and it's interesting to think about, um, there's some books on the history of this. This is probably getting super nerdy for people who aren't in this field. But the history of mass spectrometry development really goes hand in hand with geochronology. Because a lot of the systems that scientists use initially, it's the mass spectrometers plus the clean labs to make sure that you, you know, for example, one thing you've got to be really careful of is if you're crushing your rock, you want to make sure that you don't have a little leftover zircon from a previous rock. Like you have to be so um, 
OCD is a good thing in a geochronology lab. I mean, you need to be really, really careful not to have any kind of contamination and in the clean lab have, have all the right procedures. So the development of really good clean labs and then really interesting mass spectrometer technologies and um, Curtin's amazing. I, I just love walking around there because they have pretty much one of every single variety of mass spectrometer you could think of. But that development, you know, compared to when they first did doing geochronology 50 plus years ago, they were really limited by the equipment and what they could do. So they worked with some of these systems and it was exciting because you got your first results. But subsequently, um, there's been a lot of realization that some of that early geochronology wasn't wasn't quite right. Some of the assumptions weren't quite right. One of my favorite things which I like telling about is I had a student a few years ago who uh, actually she's on that article with us, um, Evelyn Diana Kamana Hoyles, a brilliant student. And she came to me one day and this was a, uh, like a technique where the, the absolute chemistry mattered. And she was analyzing stuff, di disintegrating and putting into acid. She comes to me and she goes, Hugo, I've dropped one of the samples on the bench, like in a clean lab. And I said, look, let's still analyze it and let's see what we get. And it was completely wrong. But she knew because she'd admitted the sample was on the bench. So I think they were expecting about uh, one part per billion. So teeny tiny amount of rhenium. In this case, this rock had 10,000 parts per billion. This Just remain on the bench. <laughs> but she, had, she had lots of other ones in there too. And the other yeah. one, right. And because she told me that one, it's like, watch out for that one. I was like, oh yeah, that's that's a problem. Um, but again, it was this, this previous amount of rhenium, this, this, this element that is very rare in Earth's crust, was sitting on the table somewhere. She dropped it on it. It completely wrecked that particular sample. So yeah. OCD is everything. Yeah, I'm kind of glad I don't work in one of those labs anymore, but it was um, very stressful as a student when you're learning. Yeah, you didn't have right. Are there any last uh, questions for Hugo? Let's see if there's anything in the chat. I think we're good. Thank you, everyone, for the really great turnout at this event. I'll be announcing the next one soon, and I'll just reiterate, if anyone has any leads on people who would be potential speakers, um, please reach out. We'd love to put together a great program of talks for this year. Thank you so much, Hugo. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Hugo. Thanks, everyone.